Towards the end of the 1980s, following the success of James Cameron's Aliens, sci-fi and horror continued to merge with other genres to reach a wider audience and gain commercial success. In 1987, Jack Shoulder made a movie about an alien parasite on a murder spree jumping from body to body, which blended horror and sci-fi with action and buddy cop thrillers. Why three law-abiding citizens all of a sudden go crazy and start killing people? A year later, John Carpenter took a Lovecraftian story of alien rulers hidden among us, but used it as a way to make a comedic action satire about Reaganism. I have come here to chew bubblegum and kick ass. And I'm all out of bubblegum. Oh, Join me as we continue exploring the evolution of alien horror and we discuss the hidden and they live. Welcome back to the Evolution of Horror. My name is Mike Munzer, and as ever, I am your host. If you're tuning in for the first time, then welcome. In this podcast, we explore and dissect the history and the evolution of the horror genre by looking at particular subgenres one series at a time. We are currently in the middle of our seventh series exploring the evolution of alien, sci fi, and cosmic horror, and this is is part 19. This week's episode is sponsored by $20 Patreon subscriber Jim Will Paint It. And in this week's episode, as that intro suggested, we're going to be looking at two more 80s alien cult classics, The Hidden from 1987 and They Live from 1988. So joining me to discuss this mental double bill, uh, I've got a returning guest. He was last here making his first appearance in our Mind and Body series discussing Videodrome with me and he's back. Uh, critic, journalist and author of the Book of Horror, it's Matt Glasby. Hello, Matt. How are you doing? I'm good. Thanks for having me. Oh, thank you so much for being here. Um, so, how how's 2021 been for you? How's life? Uh, yes, it's been. I can't really say it's been a banner year, but it's not been a bad year for anyone else. But um, no, I'm I'm well, and so are my family. So yeah, I can't really complain. Thank you. And congratulations on the book as well. Last time you were here, you were plugging this book that you'd written. Um, it was just about to be released. And since then, it's become a bit of a bestseller on Amazon, uh, which is awesome. If there's anyone listening that doesn't know anything about your book, because I think horror fans will be keen, right? Tell us a little bit about it. Yes. Yeah, so this is the Book of Horror, which is an illustrated guide to the scariest movies ever made with beautiful illustrations by Barney Boduano. And uh, we launched it uh, last year, just uh, at, the, <laughs> at the height of lockdown. Yes. A, an interesting time to launch a book. I had a very interesting... <laughs> interesting socially distanced book launch and yeah it's going really well it's um it's uh, it's number three on amazon horror film books today so that's love really it good. sometimes it goes right down to sort of 20s 40s 50s and other days i don't know what happens but it zooms right near to the top so i love it congratulations yeah that's awesome it seems to be doing really well um, yeah it's doing really well in, in in the uk it's been doing lots of podcasts like yours and so i've had loads of lovely response from the uk we've mm. yet to break america but uh, perhaps your american listeners can help with that Mm, yeah, that would be good, wouldn't it? Yeah, Americans, get on it. Um, so let me ask you a little bit about this subgenre of horror that we're covering this series. You know, we went from something very kind of sort of psychological and human, like we discussed last time with Cronenberg, into something much bigger and more cosmic now. We're talking about sci-fi horror and alien horror, that kind of thing. Are you a fan, Matt, generally, of kind of sci-fi and horror and where they merge? Yeah, I mean, you know, I have slightly contentious views over what constitutes horror, but I think yes. uh, <laughs> I think there's a, <laughs> there's a lot of entertainment to be had where horror and sci-fi meet. And I think there's a lot of bad sci-fi horrors, but those are very entertaining. And the ones that are good are among some of the greatest films ever made because if it fires on if it's firing on both sci-fi and horror cylinders that mm -hmm. is so much for your viewer you know you've got the fly or the thing or alien mm -hmm. you like when those are flying those films there's just there's something for everyone in those so absolutely incredible right do you have a favorite from that sort of subgenre? oh I don't think there's a much better film made in sci-fi horror than the fly and Nice. Just, there's, you know, different months I'd give you a different answer, but the last time I saw that film, I think I cried, actually. When Gina, Gina Davis, you know, says something like, but I love you. And there's just, there's so much heart in that film, as well as 
really cool sci-fi stuff amazing you know vomiting uh, yes. <laughs> like horror stuff so that is the film and it's funny as well actually isn't it so there's something for everyone as long as you've got a strong stomach there's something for everyone in the fly so yeah, yeah. i'm gonna pick that yeah the fly is perfect it's a perfect film isn't it it's 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 moving it's funny and it's just so gross yeah yeah i love it to pieces as well um so we are talking about yeah two Movies that are slightly kind of outside of the horror genre. I, even I would say that this week. And I never say that, right? Yeah. But um, I think one of the interesting things about sci-fi movies, uh, sci-fi horror movies and alien movies in particular, is that they do kind of branch out a little bit. Over the next few weeks, we're going to be talking about some proper like blockbusters too. Like we're going to be doing Independence Day and Mars Attacks and stuff like that. Um, because it's interesting to see the way that the, the a, kind of aliens as creatures did kind of go from being very scary in decades mm. like the 70s to maybe post-ET and things like that, becoming a little bit more family friendly and that kind of thing. Uh, but, you know, there's still a lot of nasty malevolent aliens out there in movies, particularly these ones we're going to talk about this week. I mean, yeah. I guess that the, the theme of this double bill is kind of... Uh, aliens that are sort of disguised as humans right that are kind of uh hidden among us i suppose uh, it's a very good way of saving some money isn't it and mm. you both get to have some amazing alien shots and then the rest of the time have like a non-star actor walking around looking at things uh, as if he's never seen them before so it's exactly. quite a, it's quite a good way of um yeah bringing things on budget exactly and i guess it goes back to classics of the genre like invasion of the body snatchers right as well are you a fan of of any of those invasion of the body snatchers movies oh my god i uh i the 70s invasion of the body oh, snatchers yeah. i saw when i was little and i just i will no i don't think anyone has seen it will ever forget that final shot of donald sutherland pointing and making that noise and oh, yeah it just god. it really it really um spoke to me actually i don't know the 90s one so well uh, no, or the or the original actually quite mm-hmm, so well. Mm-hmm. The seventies one is the bit again a perfect perfect mm. movie I think yeah. Um, so let's begin by talking about the hidden from nineteen eighty seven. Why three law abiding citizens all of a sudden go crazy and start killing people? Are we talking spacemen here. Something gets in his way, he kills it. Finds a body. Gets inside, uses it to move around. Try for one of the tires. If you think this is easy, why don't you try it? Bye. I guess a career in the police didn't really prepare you for this, did it? The Hidden. You think it's over now? You're wrong. Okay, so we have an L.A. cop, uh, Detective Beck, played by Michael Norrie, and an FBI agent, Lloyd Gallagher, played by Carl McLachlan. And they're on the trail of a killer who can leap into different bodies, and much carnage ensues. (laughs) Indeed. (laughs) Now, this was a movie, uh, literally until last night, as we were recording this, I had never seen before. Uh, And I had no plans to cover it on this series. But then, a few weeks ago, I recorded with Chris Hewitt, and he suddenly went off on one about how much he loves The Hidden. And then since then, I've had loads of tweets and messages from people going, I can't believe you've not, you've got to cover The Hidden. Uh, I can't believe you've never seen it and stuff. So uh, as per multiple requests, we're now covering this movie. Um, so I was completely new to it. But tell me a bit about your history with it, Matt. Were you sort of familiar with this film before I kind of threw it at you? I'd had that, you know, when you, when you're a horror addict, you get whispers of things and like, oh, if you've seen this, you've got to see that. So yes. I'd had the whisper that, oh, actually, this is pretty good. Mm-hmm. Um, a while ago, and watched it on DVD maybe 10 years ago, maybe five mm-hmm. years ago, and th- didn't think, uh, thought it was in its right place. Like, I don't think it deserves classic status, but it was mm-hmm. worth a watch. And so I was interesting to revisit it for this podcast because mm. actually when I put it on, um, maybe we'll come to this, I'm sure, but the first, maybe the first half an hour, the first 20 minutes are absolutely insane. Yes. And I just, I remember texting my friend, I was like, I'm, I'm an idiot. This is a masterpiece. This is amazing. Yeah. yeah. I'm not sure if the rest of the film live up to that opening, but actually just the opening alone, the opening sort of 10, 15 minutes is enough to get this like footnote status. You know, I don't think anyone's going to claim this as a classic movie, but a footnote, footnote B movie status. Definitely. I completely agree with you. When the film started, 
with that robbery and that car chase, I was like, holy shit, where has this film been yeah. all my life? This is absolutely <laughs> incredible. And yeah, I mean, overall, I still think the whole movie was fun. It was sort of, like you say, it's kind of B-movie fun. It, it It's, you know, I watched it on... I don't know, rented it on some streaming platform and it feels like the perfect sort of film that you would watch back in the day that you'd find in your video store, right? Or that you'd watch late late at night on telly or nowadays that you'd watch on streaming, right? And you'd pop it on and it's a really fun time. It's a really fun, silly 90 minutes that really zips along and it's got some awesome moments. But you're right, I don't think it necessarily belongs up there with the classics of the genre. But um, yeah, some amazing set pieces though, right? Some amazing set pieces. And I think um, the director, Jack Shoulder, is a lot deserves a lot of credit because it's a really well put together. So some of the writing, sort of a few different genres glued together a little bit messily. But mm-hmm. that opening sequence is really, really well directed. And um, he went on to make Nightmare on Elm Street 2. He already uh-huh. made Alone in the Dark. Um, actually, you know, these were before then. And he, he edited the amazing um, raft sequence in The Burning. Oh, oh yeah, you know the, the legendary. So, so he's like a, as a like a B movie craftsman. I think gives this like a real, real zip and a real pace. And actually, a lot of credit should go to him. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think you're right because it really does feel uh, it really does feel slickly directed. Particularly that opening. I mean, let's talk about that opening where it starts <laughs> off with kind of. It starts off, we're looking through sort of CCTV camera footage, right, of of people in a bank. And then this character just pulls out a gun and just starts shooting people. And then it, what follows is this insane car chase where he is being pursued by people. He's smashing through people. He's killing people left, right and centre, speeding through this park. It's absolutely insane, isn't it? But it's really well, it's a really well put together car chase, you know? It's really well put together. Um, Jack Shoulder said he, he researched all of the greatest car chases and, and, and decided that the French Connection was the one. Oh, so yeah. So sort of tried to take elements from the French Connection, have from the camera in the car or on the car. But they just, what's so amazing is that they tear up LA, but it's not Canada standing in for LA. It's not like, you know, a friend, does it? it's obviously just LA back streets. So yes. this was a thing in the 80s and early 90s you were allowed to do. And I don't know why you're allowed to do it, but they properly tear that up. And also it's got some, um, it sets out its stall, maybe a little unfairly, because it, it, it says to you, some things that happen in that scene are like, this film's really going to go there. So yeah. at one point, he runs down a wheelchair user, and you see the yes. wheelchair flying up in the air, and you think, well, he's going to swerve. Just run straight through the guy. Oh, my and God. That's it's not shocking. something you ever see. Really shocking. And also, that says nothing is off, off limits in this film. And then mm-hmm. there's the classic bit where there's two workmen uh, moving a pane of glass <laughs> across the road and the car goes through that. And obviously that's that's something we've seen spoofed since. But later on, there's a big splodge of blood on the windscreen from that incident. So you're like, it's not just, you know, a cliche. The, one of these poor workmen who are moving panes of glass to wherever workmen do that. <laughs> one of them's been like properly like minced. And yeah, and then all of the LAPD turn up and just blow the absolute shit out of the car. And you just think, yeah, that is as a mission statement. I was watching that thinking, this this is the greatest film that anyone's ever made. Ever. <laughs> it's amazing. It um I that made me laugh so much, the glass pane thing, because I grew up obsessed with Wayne's World and Wayne's World 2. Yes, and there so it's is Wayne's sequ- World, isn't it? Yeah. It's yeah. Wayne's World. And there is a there's a sequence, right, where they they see those guys early on in the film and they're like, What are you doing? And they're like, Oh, it's our job to walk up and down with this glass plate. Uh, just and they don't explain why. And they're like, Oh, interesting. And then later obviously they drive through it. But I never really knew if that was spoofing anything in particular, or if it was just a general spoof of that of that genre. But this has that exact moment with those mm. exact people holding that exact pane of glass. I was like, oh, there we go, there it is. Well, so yeah, so I mean that that that's like a ten minute sequence, and mm-hmm. it's just it's ask you ask you so many questions about what what's going to happen next, what the hell we're seeing, and it just sets out that it's going to be really tough and really funny as well. There's a good yeah. bit when it says. Um, uh, it's, it, we see the wheelchair user going up in the air and then it cuts to the cops asking his neighbours and one of them goes, he was such a nice man, <laughs> uh, the, the the perpetrator. And it's just such a great, you know, intercut sequence. It shows it's got a sense of humour and yeah, yeah. Just, it just it says you're going to have a really, really good time with this. Yeah, I completely agree with you. Um, so let's 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 briefly touch on this contentious conversation of is it or isn't it a horror film? W- would Are you firmly in the camp that this is not a horror film? This is not a horror film. Um, I don't know. I don't know how much more. It's more. I'd be more interested to hear on what grounds you could say is a horror film. There's a couple of effect sequences, and there's a couple of uh, 
not brutal, but sort of merciless murders, as we've seen. Mm. Mm-hmm. Other than that, to me, it's it's a, it's a buddy buddy cop movie, very clearly, with sci-fi elements. And actually, mm-hmm. those are the two. And, and other than that, there's not really any more horror in it than this. I'd say there's no gothic element. There's no kind of frightening element. No. Where, where do you stand on it? No, I probably agree with you. I think that there are horror adjacent elements. I do think that that, that given how, like we've just said, nasty. And in some ways intense, that first sort of 15, 10, 15 minutes are. You know, I think I was ready to believe that this was going to be a horror film when watching that setup. But you're right, it does then veer into a buddy hop catching a killer type movie. Um, It's got some great moments and it's got some grisly sort of... It touches on some sort of grisly sci-fi alien, uh, squishy alien moments when the thing sort of jumps from body to body and that kind of thing. And actually a moment that feels like it is referencing the thing where we've got the dog, right, that that is the monster as well. There's a bit of... You know, again, it kind of teases the horror genre, I think, in there. But you're right. I think ultimately it's not interested in in that horror as much as it is action i suppose it's 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 an action movie i suppose first and foremost it is and I, actually i've got to say it's one of the things that's disappointing about the film because very early on there's a really good effect sequence where a sort of slug crawls out of uh, the killer's mouth into the yes. guy in the next hospital bed's mouth uh, with like little jellyfish things and little like spider's legs it's very the thing and in fact mm. some of the sound effects for the thing are reused in this movie i'm mm-hmm. led to believe um, so it's, it's more, it's not just a coincidence. And you think, this is amazing. I'm going to see something squishy like this happening, you know, every 10, 15 minutes after all these shootouts. And actually what transpires is that it moves into a cop movie with a bit more kind of Starman, like a softer alien aspect, like mm. Starman, John Carpenter's Starman. And we only get almost as if it's been like rethought or almost as if there wasn't a budget. We only get two more effect sequences like that that sort of have that horror squishy, body horror thing. And I just mm-hmm. think because it starts with such a strong one, you were almost promised like you're going to get more and they yeah. don't turn up. And it's fine, but you just if they hadn't had that, you'd, you'd be, you wouldn't be disappointed. Yeah. I also think this is a film in which um, an alien leaps from the body of a dead stripper into a dog. And... <laughs> and I didn't think I'd ever say that sentence. But having said that sentence, this it should be more fun. <laughs> Seeing as that that exists in this film, that part of the movie should be more fun. Like you know, this this sounds insane, and actually it plays out quite standard after that. It's yeah, it does. It's, it's kind of standard. I still had a lot of fun with it. I dare say I think it was more engaging and more fun than the second film we're going to talk about. Actually, but I think I think I might agree. Actually, I think it's more consistently. It knows what it is. Yeah, you know? I agree. I agree. I did. I really had a lot of fun with it. Um, now I. I am a bit in love with Carl McLaughlin as well. So that was Are also you? a big tick in that box for me. Well, um, well, the director said that he he came in like a week before shooting and he was like a, a late addition. And mm. that he could see that Kyle was going to be a movie star. But mm. and, and so I should explain a little bit. This is a spoiler. We're allowed to use spoilers here. We, we can spoil, yeah. So it turns out that Carl McLaughlin, strange FBI out of towner, is himself an alien yes. um, hunting the, the alien down. And so there's something kind of weird and ethereal about his performance. But... He seems he seems really bland in it, and I know he has a kind of everyman quality, but his blandness in this seems like a bad performance rather than a deliberate performance. What mm-hmm. do you what did you make of it? Yeah, I know what you mean. He's very like he's almost zombie like in this film, yeah. isn't he? And, and it makes more sense, I suppose, when you find out that he's an alien. I think initially what you th- <laughs> what you're led to believe is that he's this kind Just- of grizzled slightly traumatized cop who's lost his yeah. family right um and i guess there's a bit of that to it as well and also just this idea that he's the he's like the cool suave fbi agent that mm. kind of swans in and 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 has authority over the police and everything um yeah i mean it's certainly not his best performance it's not his best performance as an fbi agent because that's twin <laughs> peaks right but uh but i do still think he's a he's very watchable i think he's got a very striking face i think there's something i okay. find very watchable <laughs> about him you know um but it's okay this is a safe space you for your kyle crush that's fine <laughs> yeah it's i very much do have a kyle crush um but yes i know what you mean he 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 doesn't he doesn't get to do a lot i suppose he doesn't really no. get to show off his acting chops too much in this in this movie in this role this is one of yes one of those things you know we so we entered into the buddy buddy cop with uptight Beck and um and an ethereal alien, mm. but and in other films like the Lethal Weapon model, um, 
they'd come to understand each other and, you know, they'd come to get a kind of banter between them. But Beck's really unlikable. He seems like a guy that's about to have a heart attack. The police stuff seems quite real. Like, they just mm-hmm. seem, like, over really overworked, stressed, like being an LA cop just seems like they do what they want and it's, it's quite a horrible pressure cooker environment. And then Kyle's so strange and ethereal that, like, they don't really gel. Um, mm. And I not um, the rumours are that no one was getting on on set. Um, that That's that interesting. one of the actors wasn't that great to work with. I'm not going to pass on these things because they're completely unsubstantiated as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> but, so you can, you, they don't have a lot of chemistry between them and we don't get a lot about either of their stories. You know, at one point, I think one of them says, um, Kyle says, he killed my partner. And then uh, Michael Norrie comes back and goes, I lost a partner once. And then it's just the next scene. You're like, we're going to investigate all these dead partners, is that mm-hmm. like? And I don't think the film's that bothered with those things. But, you know, you do need a bit of grounding with that to make this work. Um, mm. And it, it does sort of look like it's going to have the lethal weapon model and then it just doesn't really pull that off, I don't think. Mm. Yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? The way it kind of, it like dips its toe into like lots of different mm. genres and formats, but doesn't quite go there with any of them completely, I suppose. Yeah, that's yeah. it. I think that that's one of the reasons why it's it's so interesting. It's also one of the reasons why it's a tiny bit dissatisfying because I've yeah. got written down. It's got elements of the Terminator. Yeah, uh, it's got elements of the Thing. It's got elements of Lethal Weapon. There's a flamethrower and sound effects that are obviously from the Thing. There's trying to kill a senator, which is obviously from Dead Zone. All of these films are around yes. the same time or predate yes. it, and it just feels like a bit like they've taken little tiny bits from these different awesome films and oh my god if he could have completely sewn them together that this would be a classic too but as as it is it feels um like a bit of an entertaining mess but exactly one of those things if you're taken out of a blockbuster um from bottom shelf on a friday Mm -hmm. night you'd be so chuffed because because it's just got so much going on yeah it's just it's super fun isn't it but yeah you're right and i wonder whether it was kind of in, in any way inspired by that it did feel like, particularly when you look at, for example, Aliens, um, that the way that horror and action and sci-fi were sort of starting to converge around this time, right? I mean, it was the same year, I think, that we had Predator as well, which we've already talked about on this podcast as, again, as being this strange, these very macho uh, sort of action-horror hybrids, I suppose, which, again, this movie is sort of teasing, isn't it, I think? I feel like a lot of those films are, you know, in the 80s, you've got high concept, you know, something that can be summed up in one sentence. Yes. And because people have run out of one sentence, you know, so Top Gun is Star Wars on Earth, that kind of thing. Yeah. What they did instead was go into hybrid movies, where you take mm. a one-sentence movie and you give it to another movie. So you've got like, oh, it's Top Gun meets Alien, <laughs> or, you know. Yes, like, yes. So we've got like things like Alien Nation, which are like Lethal Weapon meets... Uh, you know the alien, an alien film, yeah. and uh, things like Split Second, which is uh, horror, sci-fi, buddy buddy cop, like, which is all of these things mixed together. And mm. I think they make for a very entertaining watch because you never quite know what you're going to get, but it also makes for uneven watches because you know at the same time it's to to try and to borrow elements from the Terminator, the Thing, and Lethal Weapon is a brave move because those were all very successful movies, yes. and you know who could really pull that off. So I guess there's a kind of pick and mix aspect. Yeah, I think that's absolutely right. It, it it may well have been something that was almost kind of like almost kind of designed by committee in some ways. It feels a yeah, a little like bit. That, like it? someone said, oh, we must have a so and so here. We must have a this here. Yeah, um, yeah. And so it just ends up. But what it ends up with is is this strange, many headed monster. What do you think of speaking of the monster? What do you think of the monster itself in this and the way it's portrayed? Obviously, we only get very the odd glimpse of the actual thing itself, but then we get these sort of what four or five different actors throughout the movie that kind of take on the role of this particular alien. Yeah, well, as I say, so the the, the main squishy effect, which I've written down as a slug roach, mm, which is just mm. the only way I could describe it, really, which is a horrible yeah. thought. Yeah, um, it's, it's pretty it's pretty cool and uh, sort of stop motion and it's icky and it's it's off definitely off that era, which you know, which is practical effect. Were, were so great mm. and I love that and I also love that um, so the, the first and the second guys that he jumps into are just the most ordinary every men like B-movie actors and so them going around doing weird alien stuff like killing people and stealing things mm-hmm. and is is all the more amusing because they, they just look like really ordinary people it doesn't this yeah there's something incongruous about it all later on it jumps into a stripper which is a pretty tragic <laughs> sort of version of yes. the time so obviously yes. we have to if we're going to have a female alien what she needs to be a stripper <laughs> uh, and then a dog and i did note as well that the dog gives a really good performance the dog oh actually gives a really convincing like tense look um yes. 
So yeah, but the fact I'm reviewing a dog's performance does suggest <laughs> that some of the others are, la- are lacking. Um, <laughs> well, I feel like this yeah. is one of those films that listening to us talking about it is going to make it sound like if you haven't seen this film, it makes it sound like it's the greatest thing ever, right? When yeah, like, this, yeah. This, this dog is this, you know. Um, it's great. I mean, it is really fun. It's just, yeah, it's just, it's pretty B-movie fun, I suppose. But yeah, like I, I agree. And I liked... I like I, there was something actually quite unnerving and creepy even about those two very ordinary men particularly the first mm. one in the opening scene um who I don't know there's I don't know there is that almost falling down type characteristic about him you know like he, yeah. he you believe maybe at that point before you know this is an alien movie that this is just some middle-aged white man who's just lost it right and that maybe that's what this film is going to be about at that point which is kind of interesting I think Definitely. And one of the things that um, I'm, a, I'm a big falling down fan, but one of the things that's so interesting about this is that, and the same with They Live, that they're all set and shot in LA. And both of them seem to show an LA that's like about to crumble. Like everyone's yeah. uh, rich or poor or, you know, tearing down the highway or doing coke here and doing that. Like it yes. feels like everyone's really angry. And there was like, uh, at one point, the alien steals a ghetto blaster because of the 80s. <laughs> and the shopkeeper immediately picks up a baseball bat. It's like, I'll kill you. Like, no, he's just actually stolen a tape at this point you're like well, he'll, you'll kill me over a tape this is insane it feels like a city that's about to blow and obviously the riots LA riots happened yeah. in the early 90s that falling down was sort of uh, happening at the same time as them mm-hmm. so like it does feel like the pulse of the city is this weird like angry cokey energy that's yeah. about to explode so like just shooting on those streets I find is really exciting in this and in they live and lots of films shot around the time yeah, I completely agree with you. And I do think, and this wasn't planned when I first planned to kind of talk about these films side by side, mm. but it did feel to me like it's maybe, maybe deliberately, maybe not, but look, sort of commenting a bit or looking at that idea of kind of 80s consumerism. I mean, this yeah. idea that this alien wants, he, he will want something and he will get it, basically. And there is a lot of this all throughout the film that oh, is that your car? How did you afford that? Oh, I stole it. Oh, there's, like you say, there's cocaine, there's car, there's like fancy cars, there's all of this stuff, there's ghetto blasters, there's stuff, right? And it yeah. does feel a bit like a film about that, about kind of um, consumerism run amok almost, I suppose, to the point where this character is literally just kind of ploughing through town, getting what he wants, I suppose. Yeah, I think um, consumerism run amok is a really great way to look at it. I don't, again, I don't think there's a clear through line of no. thinking in the film, but I think there are, yeah, there are loads of moments um, that, that are second alien guy goes and steals a Ferrari from a coked up guy in a white suit and he's saying say the ghetto blaster there's all this kind of uh like 80s ideas of 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 things that we accumulate and this seems the alien seems to want that it seems to want to kill it seems to want to like it wants a Ferrari it wants a ghetto blaster wants all this stuff we don't really know why the stripper has it like a dollar thong I don't know if that's a stripper thing or if that's an alien thing but like there's there's loads of imagery of like of accumulation and I guess maybe it's reacting to the yuppies and to sort of Reaganism and uh, like rampant economics of that time even if it's not reacting like it's not a coherent reaction to it but there are no. definitely little pinpoints in which in which that jumps out i think so definitely and i think you are supposed to kind of think these characters a lot of these characters are complete douchebags right as well like yeah. the car salesman with his little co- yeah. car of cocaine and all of that yeah. stuff like again it's kind of it's sort of looking at the ludic- ludicrousness and kind of grotesqueness almost i think of that that world i think yeah. you know which is interesting yeah you're right and also like i say you know they, it, it's pretty it's a pretty sorry look at the city and it's quite a sorry look at the police department who are just like something awful happens and they're like oh it's going to be a long night like they don't care <laughs> and so yeah it, if, if it's looking at the soul of LA and finding it wanting I guess <laughs> um, now we've touched upon this already but let me ask you a bit about these two cops then because it does kind of it kind of attempts to kind of build up this sort of relationship between them there's the moment when Carl McLaughlin's character goes to Michael Norrie's kind of family's home right and there's that kind of slightly awkward family dinner that they all have and everything of course there is that sort of sort of twist ending well not really a twist but there is that ending where he is t- essentially kind of takes on his partner's life right he disguises it like the, the alien the good alien jumps into his partner's body and then has that family lifestyle essentially um which was kind of interesting but what did you think of kind of these two characters at the center of this and their dynamic i think well like i say i think kyle is is a is, is a strange performance and i think uh, michael norrie's performance is really dislikable i mean it's quite believable uh-huh. he does seem like a sort of 
reasonably unpleasant LA yes. cop. But yes. this isn't like Riggs. You know, this isn't someone that's like movie crazy, but you know, is super charismatic. Like, it just seems like quite a distant kind of grumpy kind of guy. And the scene in which he takes him home is very, very strange. Like, they're putting the little <laughs> little girl to bed, and then turn around. Carl's just there, like just pointing at her, and no one goes. <laughs> All right, Carl, what's going on, mate? They sort of play him in as if he's like, oh, don't worry, he's from Denver, wherever he's yeah. from. <laughs> That's what they're doing. I'm like, no, no, in Denver, this would still be weird. So still I, weird. <laughs> I, don't, I don't think, yeah, it's almost as yeah, I don't think... I don't think that stuff really works, to be honest. No, no. And I think they had to they had to rush to get to that point where they yeah. have some kind of connection, right? Where that where it that makes that last sequence maybe feel slightly more meaningful in some way. And it did feel like on paper we've got to get to that part, but it didn't really put the time in, I suppose, or the writing. Yeah, it's a little bit grafted yeah. on, isn't it? <laughs> it is, it is. Um so there you go. I mean, I don't know how much more there is to say about this. Is there anything else you want to mention on The Hidden? Any other kind of highlight moments that we haven't discussed or picked out? There's no more highlight moments, but you should look out for an appearance, cameo appearance from a young Danny Trejo. Oh, I did not spot him. He's in one of the police cells. You know, there's there's a big uh, climatic shootout with grenades and bazookas in a police police station. Of course there is. And he's one of the crooks in that. And he says, um, yo, hippie, what kind of do do you? (laughs) Oh, my God. I love it. Apparently he ad-libbed. So go Danny. Um, (laughs) Well done, Danny. Well done. Yeah, I noticed that the, the, the first guy to inhabit the alien was Chris Mulkey, who is also, for any Twin Peaks fans, he was in Twin Peaks. Uh, Hank Jennings from seasons one oh. and two of Twin Peaks. So again, it, obviously this was pre-Twin Peaks, but him and Carl McLaughlin together on screen at the beginning, I was like, this is very exciting for me. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. I loved that. Yeah, that was good. And also an appearance from Lynn Shay of the yes. Insidious and Nightmare on Elsie series. She is the sister of Bob Shay, who uh, was the, one of the producers on the films. Indeed, yeah, she actually uh, she pops up in a lot of New Line Cinema movies yeah, for that yeah, reason, it? right? Which you'll have been Shay. watching a lot of, I guess. But, um, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. So obviously she's like, she's the teacher in A Nightmare on Elm Street. And she's like, around this time, she played a lot of kind of bit parts in New Line Cinema movies, actually. Um, but it was great to see her as well, yeah. Yeah, yeah, the only, the only final thing that occurs to me is that this film has basically got the same plot as one of the naked guns. Oh my God, really? And they, yeah, well, they... They're about assassinating a senator or assassinating someone in the mm-hmm. naked guns, and the killer is is mind controlled, so it jumps from person to person. <laughs> I was watching the end of it; it's quite silly, obviously, because it's, it's a spoof. I was watching the end of this, thinking, "This is the plot from." And one of the naked guns films is like a year later, or like two years later. <laughs> so, anyone listening to this and who knows more about this than we do, just look at the. It's a good comparison point of. I think it's Naked Gun one, but it might be two or thirty three and a third. So <laughs> I love it. It did remind me of a lot of different movies. There was. Do you remember in the 90s there was a Denzel Washington movie about something that was jumping, like like a... Fallen. Yeah, Fallen. Fallen, And that was more like a sort of demonic or devil kind of presence, wasn't it? Sort of jumping between bodies. That's much more horror than this is, so maybe we should cover it in the future. (laughs) Yeah, I should have done that. Yeah, it's true. Yeah, but it does. It feels so reminiscent of so many other movies, doesn't it? It's a strange kind of... Yeah, strange kind of combination. How do you think it holds up then? So it's like, what, 20? It's coming up to 25 years old next year. Um, No, 35, 35. So it's coming up to 35 years old next year. As old as me, in fact. I was born in 87, so I should have known that. Uh, But how how do you think it holds up generally? I think pretty well. I think, you know, if you've heard any of this chat, you know if this film is for you or not. Mm -hmm. And if if you're remotely interested by some of those things, you're going to get something out of it. Uh, Mm -hmm. Whereas if, if... if this is not your bag, then it's very much not your bag. But yeah, it's yeah. good. It's well directed. Um, you know, it's the effects are really good. Uh, there's nothing embarrassing from the you know the time embarrassingly dated, uh, mm-hmm. except perhaps the sexual politics. But um, yeah, the yeah. the stripper that has the dress that just has the hole in the butt basically it's like what? And there were just a lot of shots of that. And I actually thought at some point that was going to be important to the plot i don't know why i thought that of course it wasn't gonna be no it's just I, the I, 80s it's just the 80s but they- no, I, do, I do think i do think that the film on its own basis does hold up as a flawed but you know fun work and actually talking about it, it's made me want to watch it again i know right I, that's the thing i kind of love about this podcast is that you can you can come out of a movie and go yeah that was all right and then when you talk about it for a bit you go actually this was really fun yeah i really enjoyed it but uh yeah so there you go so that's the hidden from 1987 glad i finally got to see it 
Hello, everybody. Just interrupting this week's episode to thank this week's sponsor. That's $20 Patreon subscriber, Jim Will Paint It. Uh, now, for those of you, I mean, I, I hope most of you know Jim Will Paint It and know his work. If you are very present on Twitter or Instagram or the internet in general, I'm sure you would have seen many of Jim's uh, pictures, artwork shared around the internet. He is a- an incredible artist who I've been a fan of for a very long time who basically draws pictures on Microsoft Paint. People can request a picture and he will draw it, anything, as like weird and wonderful as you can imagine. I'm a huge fan of his. Uh, so it's a real honour to know that Jim is a listener of the podcast, he's a fan of the podcast, and he is a Patreon subscriber of the podcast. So a huge thank you to Jim um, for being this week's $20 donor and sponsor. Uh, Jim sent me a little message. He said... Hey Mike, I've been a huge fan of the pod since midway through the slasher season, way back when. So many of Brad's obscure also-ran recommendations have since become firm favourites, and your discussions on the classics and brand new releases, not to mention my all-time favourite show, Twin Peaks, enrich my enjoyment, each without ruining the magic through stuffy over-analysis. It's the podcast equivalent of discussing horror films over a pint with your mates and long may it continue. I'd like, if possible, to give a plug to my Ultimate 80s Halloween Party t-shirt and print. It features a whole load of 80s horror characters carving pumpkins with chainsaws and watching video nasties and such, and if anyone is going to appreciate the references, it'll be the listeners of your show. If you go to jimmel.co.uk slash collections slash horror, you'll see it and all my horror-related stuff. All of it proudly created on an archaic version of MS Paint. Oh, Jim, I mean, I thank you so much for that lovely message and the kind words about the podcast. And um, I am such a huge fan of all of your work. And in fact, I actually purchased this 80s Halloween uh, print that he's talking about. It's absolutely gorgeous. I've got a large framed edition, which I'm now going to hang on my wall. And it's basically like, it, it's basically every 80s horror icon you can imagine sat in a living room playing video games, like he said, carving pumpkins, You've got Jason, Ash, uh, you've got Elvira in there, Pinhead, Freddy Krueger, Chucky, you've got The Thing. Uh, There are so many, the the face hugger I can spot. It's like a great game as well, where it's like, how many can you spot in that picture? Uh, It's a beautiful piece of artwork. And like Jim said, you can pick up a print or a t-shirt from his website. That's jimmel.co.uk. That's J-I-M-L-L.co.uk. So, yeah. Yeah, and again, one more time, just a huge thank you to Jim Will Paint It. If you're not following Jim Will Paint It on Twitter or Instagram, get on it because he does some absolutely incredible stuff. A big thank you to this week's sponsor and $20 Patreon subscriber, Jim Will Paint It. And if you want to become an official Evolution of Horror sponsor, just like Jim, get your own little segment in the middle of an episode where you could plug your own work, your website, your podcast, your art, your band, whatever it might be, then sign up now patreon.com slash evolution of horror that's patreon.com slash evolution of horror well no one told me about her the way she lied but it's too late to say you're sorry how would i know why should i care please don't bother trying That little catchy number is taken from the trailer for Titan, the new movie from Julia DeCorno. It won the Palm d'Or at Cannes earlier this year. This is her follow-up to her 2016 hit, Raw. And, oh my God, I mean, I think this is the best film I've seen all year. It's gross, it's shocking, it's provocative, it's hilarious, it's terrifying. It's everything. It's a roller coaster ride. Uh, it was the first movie that I sat down and watched with Brad Hansen at London Film Festival this year. And oh my god, what a way to kick off the festival. As well as that, we saw the new Edgar Wright film last night in Soho. We saw Lamb, that 
bonkers Icelandic sort of horror fantasy film starring Numi Rapace. We saw Dashcam, the latest movie from Rob Savage, director of Host, which is an absolutely insane found footage movie as well. Uh, we saw some really incredible stuff and that's a little hint of what we've got going on over on Patreon this week. I sat down with Brad Hansen and we talked about some of the best horror and genre stuff we saw at this year's festival. So many amazing films and a few bad films to discuss in that lineup. So if you want to hear this week's episode that will be available to $5 Patreon subscribers and upwards patreon.com slash evolution of horror everybody who signs up at a five dollar level will get access to a whole back catalogue of other bonus episodes you can also go up to a ten dollar level which will get you additional episodes those are the exclusive mini seasons like our hitchcock series our hellraiser series our saw series and our twin peaks series so a ton of great stuff to listen to everybody who signs up from the uk will get sent an evolution of horror sticker and everybody who signs up no matter what tier or where you're from we'll get a little shout out on the podcast as a thank you so i'm going to give everybody who signed up to our patreon in the last couple of weeks a little thank you so a big thanks to wes king liam harvey lisa don phil b danny mccardle elliot tickle cat kinds eloise you bob for apples in the toilet and you like it Yes, you can give me any kind of name you want and I will read it. Uh, Delilah Keller, Becky Bray here, Emma Clark, Robert R. Conroy, Bruce and Perry, Orin Belizio, BL Dement07, Michael Ty, Ollie D. Valtison, Steve Kachuk, Connor O'Shea, Cameron Gunn, Anthony Nelson, Benjamin Cockle, Martin Dunlop, Matt Monaco, Andrea Rourke, Layla Latif, hello Layla, Bart Roberts, Michael Lafferty, Brett Keegan, Kyle Kavanagh, Adam Bowman, Brett S. Java C., Eric Hecht, Juliet Sugg, and Paddy Register. A huge thank you to all of those people for signing up to our Patreon. And one more time, if you want to join them and get treated to a whole bunch of bonus episodes and more, then sign up now. Patreon.com slash evolution of horror. That's patreon.com slash evolution of horror. Okay, let's head into the second half of this week's episode as Matt Glasby and I sit down to discuss all things They Live from 1988. Uh, uh, masters! What do these things want and why are they here? You still don't get it, do you, boy? They have recruited the rich and the powerful. They're running the whole show. Wake up! They're all about you, all around you. Blind us to the truth! Take a look. They are safe. As long as they are not discovered. I don't know what they are or where they came from, but we gotta oh, stop them. Stay away from me. Put these on. They have us. Look at them. They're everywhere. Our owner. We have no other choice. I don't like this one bit. Leave it alone, man. It ain't none of my business. Ain't none of yours. We have been lulled into a trance. Listen to what I'm saying to you. We're in trouble. The whole world's in trouble. Control us! You're sending some kind of signals on the TV sets. I've got one that can see. Mama don't like tattletale. Now we start spilling some blood. Let's go! Push the button. I have come here to chew bubble gum and kick it. And I'm all out of bubble gum. So the story of They Live, we begin with a drifter who's uh, nameless, but he's called John Nada, Mm. played by the wrestler Rowdy Roddy Piper, who comes to L.A. looking for work and meets uh, Frank Armitage, played by Keith David. Instead of finding work or a home, what they find is a conspiracy involving aliens from outer space, exploiting mankind and joining up with the ruling classes to grind the faces of the poor. Yes. Lovely. So tell me a little bit about your own kind of history and relationship with this movie. Would you remember when you first saw it? And and what do you think of the film now? I don't remember when I first saw it. Um, I think it was one of those things where you start getting into a carpenter and you start, you know, uh, collecting those films. It probably late night, Channel 4, back in the day. Um, And 
actually the first time I, I do remember seeing it properly as a grown up is I saw it on VCD in Hong Kong. And VCDs are the worst ever invention. There were two, they're like a DVD split in half. There's two sides, you have to turn it over. And it, it's meant to be better quality than video, and but not as good as DVD. So I remember watching it on this terrible, terrible format um, in the early noughties. And yeah, I can't really, I was quite sure what I made of it. I don't mm. think it's a vintage Carpenter, but it's such a strange, strange movie. And this, mm-hmm. this, basically two incredible sequences from it which i'm sure we'll get on to mm-hmm. and those will be talked about as long as we're talking about john carpenter and all the rest of it is a little bit more so so yeah yeah i kind of agree with you it's a movie that i read about and knew about before i saw it and i was very excited to see it and like you say there are some real standout moments of carpenter mm. greatness i don't know if it quite hangs together as a whole as well as some of his other stuff and it's interesting isn't it? i think i read about this i think it might have been total film even when i was younger or somebody i remember wrote about the kind of the run of John Carpenter films as being one of the best kind of streaks, I suppose, that a director yeah. had. And actually, funny enough, I think we probably discussed this when we talked about Cronenberg and that run he oh, had yeah. through the 80s, yeah, yeah. right? John Carpenter is up there too, right? I mean, if you look at his IMDb, this feels like at the end of an incredible run of films where we've got starting from let's say, Assault on Precinct 13, and just look at his feature films. You've got Assault on Precinct 13, Halloween, The Fog, Escape from New York, The Thing, Christine, Starman, Big Trouble in Little China, Prince of Darkness, and They Live. Wow. And that that's not a bad run, is it, through the through the sort of the bulk of the 80s that Carpenter had there? It's not. Most people, like, it's actually most people didn't have a very good 80s, but no. certainly Cronenberg did, Argento did. And yeah, for the certainly the first part, Carpenter definitely did. I think it got yeah. patchy. I mean, I'm, I love Big Trouble in Little China. I'm not a massive fan of Prince of Darkness. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's very and, weird. <laughs> and I don't think I've seen Starman in, in years and years and years and years. Uh, so I can't comment on those. But yeah, it's a hell of a run. And also at this point, he's, you know, it's, it's, it's quite a lot of variety for someone that was considered a horror director i mean actually all of these are going all over the shop aren't they yeah yeah i mean like that's what that was something i talked about with with jamie when we did the thing a few weeks ago that how many of his movies would you call absolute sort of pure horror i mean halloween (laughs) halloween yeah i mean the fog i would say halloween the no no halloween in the fog that's it for me oh come on you'd call the the thing i wouldn't i wouldn't (gasps) I wrote a book about it and I wouldn't, no. Unbelievable. The thing, I would say the thing, and Christine, I would say Christine. Oh yeah, Christine, yeah, I forgot that. (laughs) (laughs) Three, I said three, we can go Uh, back. But also we talked about on our cult series, we talked about... What's it called? Oh, Prince of Darkness. We talked about Prince of Darkness. And I've talked before about In the Mouth of Madness as well. But yeah, I love In the Mouth films. of Madness. Oh, yeah, that's another horror film. Four horror films. Four horror films. <laughs> okay, okay. Interesting. <laughs> oh, and there's, and there's the later ones as well. Okay, so just completely ignore everything I mean, He made lots of horror films. I, I know. But, I yeah, I mean, once you get beyond the sort of mid-90s, it's not... not not really worth discussing, is it? Escape from L.A., Vampires, Ghosts of Mars, The Ward. Yeah. I mean... Bless him, but it, he really was at his peak um, in the eighties. Here was so he? many great, so many great films, and um, although this may be lesser Carpenter, it still you know uh, would be quite something for anyone else. And yes. it's such a strange, such a strange, strange movie just to have got it made at all. Um, yeah, definitely, it's worth talking about. A very strange movie, like it's tonally even you know speaking of genre this is a strange old film isn't it as well it's kind of like wacky comedy in places it almost feels like some kind of cowboy movie at times or something Mm. and then yeah then there's this kind of action kind of sci-fi fun there's obviously a lot of heavy satire going on in there as well um yeah do you think how well do you think this whole movie kind of hangs together then not well to be honest this it's a movie of three parts we've got quite a slow opening with um mm-hmm. uh roddy piper sort of looking around and trying to work out what's going on and yeah. i think that he's not a very expressive actor in terms of um watching he's not a sort of watchful thinky actor mm-hmm. so i don't i think that could use an action sequence early on i think that that's quite a slow half hour soaking up then yeah. when he works out what is going on basically he puts on some sunglasses <laughs> and he sees that all of the the rich people around have got like skull like aliens and all of the mm-hmm. adverts and everything that he sees are sort of subliminal messages to consume and obey and reproduce and this that's an incredible half hour of him wandering around seeing the world through these glasses and, and without these glasses and then effectively killing all the aliens that he sees. So this is this insane half hour. And then the final half hour is him and Keith David um, trying to take down the signal and his sort of A-team style is quite a 
pedestrian action movie. There's no jeopardy. There's no, you know, they're like, oh, we'll go and do this. And they just sort of go and do it. There isn't really, I don't think that bit has been very thought through. So, but that half an hour in the middle is the reason mm-hmm. we're talking about this film. And that is incredible. I completely agree with you. I, 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 I almost say this movie is a little bit overrated, actually, because I think you're right. I mean, it's got some spectacular sequences in the middle, but there is a lot where I was like, okay, you know, like like you say, it takes half an hour for him to kind of figure out what's... It takes half an hour before he puts the sunglasses on, basically, yeah. right? And until then, it's pretty slow going. And like you say, that final act is is kind of fairly bombastic, I suppose, but a bit kind of a bit bland at the same time, I think, you know? Yeah, it's not it's not anything we haven't seen before. And um, yeah. it's also, you know, this is a whole a sophisticated alien race that have come down and are mind controlling the humans. And then Roger Piper and Keith David just rock up with a couple of machine guns and take the whole lot down in like 20 minutes. It's, <laughs> it is like an A-team episode, that it bit is. at the end. And um, it's a bit unfortunate. It's, it's, it's like, and John Carpenter said it's, it's against Reaganism and that, it's, that it is, that he's, it's a, it's it's he's expressing his viewpoint about the world which he's never done before and that comes across really well and really forcefully but almost the story is an afterthought it feels like this amazing short film about a guy waking up and seeing the real truth with no real sense of how to begin that and no real sense of the ending and it came from a short story um by ray nelson so maybe i haven't read that short story but maybe that's you know short stories often don't have the movie act of beginning middle and an end maybe this doesn't add maybe the whole shootout and add on yeah uh, yeah that's really interesting isn't it and it does and this is something i've talked about a lot with a lot of alien horror movies from the fi- from the 80s is that they they're all tending to draw on the kind of tradition of the 50s sort of alien movies the kind of late night movies or the serials or the kind of graphic novels of this time as well and this is certainly part of that i think and yeah maybe you're right maybe because it's a short story Maybe that's why it kind of feels a little bit stretched or something. Mm. I don't know. He also, I mean, I don't know whether he, he kind of, he does this a lot in a lot of his films, but he sort of pays tribute to people like H.P. Lovecraft, right? And this is something he did in in, in The Mouth of Madness. And I think he uh, he used the pseudonym Frank Armitage in this movie as the writer, right? Um, which is a uh, name of a character in the Dunwich Horror. So, you know, there is that kind of Lovecraft nod there, but do you see mm. any kind of Lovecraftian element to this film? In no, any way? he's explained that, that, that the screenplay was such a collaboration with Roddy Piper and others that he didn't want to take full credit for it. And also he says that this is a film about the hidden and the underneath and the right. gods underneath. The horror that, you course, don't see. Mm. Right, and the H.P. Lovecraft thing, you know, is the huge forces that, that we don't see underneath it all. Um, so that's, yeah, that's kind of cool. I mean... Mm. Mm-hmm. It's also, I mean, just imagine being so prolific and amazing that you could make a film like this and, and use a pseudonym as opposed to trying to claim all the credit for yourself like like most people would do. So he's such a dude in that respect. I mean, he did the score as well, you know, like he always does. And, you know, there's, it's, yeah, it's quite something. The but score also- is great. The score <laughs> is great. And I love, I mean, his scores are always so simple, right? But this one particularly, where it's just like, down, down, down. But that's all it is for like an hour and a half, right? It's it does get, yeah, it gets on your tiny, gets a tiny <laughs> bit wearing after a while. I think that's one of the things you feel like it, the pace needs to pick up action wise. And yeah. then, yeah, when the score's doing, bah, 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 for about 40 minutes, yeah, it does, it does, it kind of drags a bit, which it's mad when you describe this movie to people. It doesn't sound like it could possibly drag because there's so much in it. But all of that that's in it is in that middle section. Yes, exactly that. I was reading something and I can't find the exact quote now, but he said, um, he he once said in an interview that he, he carried with him through the 80s, he described it as an adolescent anger towards authority. Um, that kind of hatred of authority of the, of the man, I suppose, really, that this movie really taps into. But I think that word adolescent is quite interesting because there, there is something that feels a bit teenage boy of this movie. Yeah, Do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. The overlong fight scenes, the just the, those characters with their guns and everything, it does feel kind of adolescent in a way, doesn't it? It does, doesn't it? And the only female character is completely, like, she feels like she's been beamed in from another galaxy. <laughs> like, she's she's not, she doesn't feel like a real person. She's quite a, a strange-looking lady. She's got the amazing coloured hair and green eyes. And she yeah. just look. she isn't part of the boys' game that is running no. around and shooting at all. And I think she's a baddie, but I can't exactly remember why. Like, it's she's not very well fleshed out. She's just a no. sort of yuppie tag-along. You think she'll be love interest, and then she's not, and then she's you think she's about it because she's not that important you're right this is a world in which they don't need to be strong women because it's a teenage boys 
fantasy, definitely. That makes yeah, loads of sense. It does. Something that would make a real difference to it is is cited in Roddy Piper's character. So I think so at the start, he's like, what he does have is a kind of bland, benign presence, like a kind of old cowboy figure. Like it's not like he's, it's not a bad performance. It's just not, he doesn't do watchful. He doesn't do thinking. And he's he plays the harmonica and he says, I believe in America. And actually there's quite a sweet um, idealist in there and then the moment that he sees the truth and starts shooting he turns into like a badass action hero and starts saying badass action hero stuff but he says actually says I figured it'd be something like this the second he, he sees the aliens and you're like <laughs> but that's not that character whereas Keith David's character is very cynical and actually what would have been much more interesting is to have a cynical guy who'd been beaten by the system and would thought everything was against him suddenly realise that everything was against him and that would join those two acts really well. And as it is, he's this bland kind of, I wonder from town to town, like a TV character, yeah. suddenly becoming like flip and giving all these, you know, cynical one-liners and, and going against the system. But where did that come from? Like, There's nothing in him to do that. And actually that would anchor the whole movie, I think. Yeah, you're so right. Yeah, maybe had that character already been that sort of slightly paranoid i mean what this movie yeah, could yeah, exactly. be is a sort of paranoia thriller right in the way that the 70s invasion of the body snatchers yeah. is but it doesn't it doesn't actually seem interested in being that film does it really you know there is no there's not really any sense of paranoia in this even you know it's no. interesting yeah no and exactly if that was there earlier on then it would totally bed down when it happens as it had instead what happens is there's this huge explosion of what the fuck yeah and um it isn't bedded down and then so from there there's no effort to go than a shootout you know which yes. lots of things do when they don't know how to resolve themselves yeah but yeah totally. i just think you're right there would, there would be something in this and there's, there's been talk of a remake and stuff over the years but yeah to have a kind of you know, imagine like a paranoid christian bale kind of crazy yes. type who it, whacking it, phoenix it, or something or whacking <laughs> phoenix, who is down and out and thinks everything's against him and suddenly realizes that there is this whole thing against him and i think that would be such an interesting character arc as it is this sort of affable roddy piper suddenly turns into arnie and um yeah i don't think that really works yeah i like his i think i like carpenter's bleaker stuff more i mean obviously around this where we've got his what he now calls the apocalypse trilogy right with yeah. with um they you know the thing prince of darkness and in the mouth of madness that real kind of quite quite dark tone where you feel like th there's a real sense of dread from the beginning with those films this movie even though it kind of it kind of does have an apocalypse by the end and yeah. yet it doesn't really feel like an apocalypse movie in the way that those ones are this this is so much more playful i suppose it is and also you know there's the, the there's the famous one-liners that uh, Roddy Doyle was... Roddy Piper, sorry, Roddy Doyle, that'd be amazing. <laughs> <laughs> Irish novelist, Roddy Doyle. Yeah. No. <laughs> Roddy Piper comes up with uh, one-liners uh, that he was going to use in wrestling, his wrestling matches. So it gives it that very cartoony. And John Carpenter talks about moving away from the invulnerable 80s action movie hero like Arnie. But actually, that's exactly what he's given us. Because, you know, Piper turns up and says, what's the famous line? I've come here to chew bubblegum and kick ass and I'm all out of bubblegum yeah. and things like that. And you're like, well, these are happening outside the movie. The character wouldn't have thought of those. These have been thought by someone outside the movie giving their character something cool to say. So all of a sudden there's no reality anymore. This is just an action movie. Yeah, you're absolutely right. And again, really does feel in that tradition of, like we've talked about, those macho 80s action movies, right? Yeah. It's one year after Predator, that you are one ugly motherfucker type lines. Yeah, isn't yeah, it? yeah, and it's, exactly. it's, it's, it's got that kind of vibe. Do you think that this would have been better handled by another actor? Like, for example, you know, Carpenter collaborator um, Kurt Russell, for example, in that lead role. Do you think that would have added anything? Well, I think certainly he would. Have, you'd have had to make him cynical if it was Kurt Russell. You couldn't have him be this kind of, you know, I believe in America type. And so that immediately solves some of the problems we're talking about. Also, you know, Kurt Russell is a better actor than Molly Pipe. That's just a fact. So in that sense, that might be better. There is something kind of... Part of this movie's what the fuckness is added to by by Piper's presence, definitely. Like yes. he is a wrestling a wrestler, not an actor, and he brings a kind of insane physicality to it. That obviously there's the famous fight sequence, which I'm sure we're going to discuss, yes, and it to. just adds to this whole like what were they smoking vibe oh. that surrounds the whole movie. Um, whether that's a good thing or not, I, I'm not entirely sure that it is. I think th there was I think there's a great movie to be made of this material by John Carpenter, and I don't think this is it. But it is a lot of fun and um yeah it's not one you're going to forget anytime soon 
Yeah, we, we've very much moved, haven't we, from the sort of early 80s cocaine era John Carpenter when he, when he was doing like <laughs> Halloween 2 and Halloween 3 and all of that insane stuff. Uh, we're in the stoner era now, John Carpenter, right? <laughs> Everything feels a little bit more silly and playful and chill. Uh, and it's it, it's such a different tone to some of his early 80s stuff. I just can't say, you know, like he's, he says it's an action movie and you're like, it's an action movie in which nothing happens for half an hour. So yeah. you better be diehard if you're an action movie with nothing happening in the first half hour, like no action. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, exactly. So um, let me, I'll come to the fight scene in a minute, but first of all, let me ask you about that. You know, the, the images that I remember seeing before I'd ever even seen the film were those images of where he puts on the sunglasses, right? And what do you think of that and how that's handled that that you know uncovering of another world, I suppose, when he puts the sunglasses on, we go into black and white, billboards change people change we've got that kind of alien makeup on people what do you think of all that and and how that's sort of handled i i love it yeah it's, it's I so love fun it. it's not a genre but if like films where one reality bleeds into another are probably my favorite whether that's sci-fi <laughs> or horror hence i love cronenberg hence yeah. i love that kind of stuff you know visions coming true and so him putting on these ridiculous sunglasses which is such an, an 80s vision and then seeing this i think the skull-faced aliens look amazing they're like emaciated because they're in black and white as well they look like 1950s b-movie bad guys yes so they look really cool and then he looks down the street and everything's sort of uh, black and white and all of the billboards it's like f- f- as far as the eye can see have got this this mind control material on them mm-hmm. and that stuff looks amazing like that's it that's does. just yeah that's that's really it's a really it's a really consistent vision of what what could be happening and uh, you just think at that point that like like you can't wait to see more of this stuff and actually every time he sees the aliens you know sometimes they talk into their watches and say like we've got one who can see mm-hmm. they, there's quite a friss on like i find them not scary but like yeah really effective actually I and do. the practical effects are really good as well carpenter's such a good visual storyteller i think isn't he that's what he's so good at he's yeah. very good at like really telling a good story with very little like his his movies are always pretty low budget they're pretty simple they're pretty stripped back and economical but he always does such a good job with that kind of thing and i yeah i love that as well i love that kind of visual motif i, I almost wish there had just been a little bit more of it actually you mm. know because it's really fun yeah um and yeah there is there's something kind of playful but also kind of creepy about all of these aliens and when they start to sort of clock him you know that he can see them and that kind of thing there's some good moments there yeah yeah exactly where do you run if you know if you're already down and out and you know the police uh, at one point show have shown the police raiding the camp that he lives in like he's Mm -hmm. already on the margins of society and then you realize that all of the society is actually against you there is a conspiracy Mm -hmm. and there's you know that there's um skull-faced aliens uh controlling everything and they hate you yeah Yeah. that's brilliant that's such an amazing concept and um i can't believe that the film isn't slightly better (laughs) yeah uh, and then, like you say, we have like what the longest punch up scene in 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 history, maybe. Uh, let me ask Where you about start? that that alley fight scene. What do you think of that? Well, so a bit of context. Um, he's trying to convince Keith David to put the glasses on and see the truth, and Keith mm-hmm. David doesn't want to, and Sam is fed up with him. And <laughs> and what <laughs> follows is the most ridiculously protracted fist fight, perhaps <laughs> in in film history whereby they just absolutely slug the living shit out of each other they stop they rest have a bit of a laugh breather get and then carry up, on hitting, yeah. in order to put these sunglasses on so, so Keith David will see the truth um, you could argue and someone has that it's about how difficult it is to make someone else see your viewpoint mm. you could also argue that it's a bunch of bored dudes one of whom's a wrestler trying to work out what the fuck to do with this movie because yeah. I mean it's it's an amazing fight scene it's crunching they do moves I've never seen before there's a flying groin knee mm-hmm. one of them does and it just repeatedly does it I'm like that's 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 quite something yes. but it also like um, like the, the like the action one liners kind of pulls you out of the movie a little bit because it's such a spectacle in and of itself and it doesn't really make any narrative sense so it's one of these things that's, that people talk about it because it's incredible it's a really great fight scene it's almost it's almost to the detriment of the movie in a way yes because it just sticks out so much doesn't it so it's, much yeah I, I, I totally agree and it is really fun like it really does make me it it's makes great, me yeah. go oh my god this is so much fun and it does feel like you're just watching WWF mm. or something right you know like the, even the, the kind of noises that Roddy makes is like oh and all that and he's like yeah. slamming people on the ground I mean it really is like we just suddenly we've stopped the movie for a moment to just watch a wrestling match or punch up happen um across like 10 15 minutes of the runtime it's yeah 
astounding. And it's quite, a, it's quite a, it's not that long a film either. So to put no. all this uh, subtext in and, you know, the whole world, as you know, is a lie. Oh, and there's a 10 minute fight sequence. There's just two blokes in a parking lot. Like this is, this is really strange. And I almost wonder if, you know, if, if Carpenter talks about collaborating with, um, with Piper on this, if this wasn't Piper's, one of his main contributions is having just such a huge fight scene, you know. Yes. Whereas actually, if he'd had Kurt Russell there, Russell might not have pushed for such a I don't know I don't know it's, it's fascinating it's such a strange strange moment in, in cinema and this, you know, this isn't John Carpenter knows what he's doing he's made masterpieces and you know he's made masterpieces Halloween is not got one moment wasted like, there's no mm-hmm. fat on that so to, to, maybe he's having fun like, maybe he's just enjoying himself with this but it's such a strange viewing experience yeah and you know it that's the other thing about carpenter isn't it like for a guy that had such an incredible run he then such had he had such an incredible dip didn't he and it is astounding actually at just the quality and how much it changes from about this point i mean apart from mm. in the mouth of madness which was kind of a bit of an anomaly yeah. this movie is that start of that decline isn't it in a way i think um it's very strange yeah you don't know what's going on in people's um personal lives i guess because you're right for, to have such a huge Dip, or always that someone indulges one side of what, what they're into, um, like this stupid fight scene, and goes, "That was amazing. Let's do more of that." You know, I, I just, yeah, I can't really, I can't really speculate. I guess you know the guy made so many great films that you know everyone eventually, uh, everyone eventually makes something bad, or you know, you get, yeah, you got it, and then it's gone. And you know, so at least after such an amazing run, and there was still in the mouth of madness, which was amazing and sort of six what, six years later or something so and yeah it's not like they live as a bad film it's just it's just a very strange one and, and um, i and i think maybe you know there is that feeling isn't there when you hear him talk that he was incredibly successful despite uh, the the movie studios he worked with not because of them like they didn't really ever support him or have much faith in him by the sounds of it and obviously movies like the thing that were huge flops at the time and then he like lost other projects that he could have done and it it was almost like he never got the chance to be that kind of Spielberg level filmmaker. And I wonder if also you can just feel a bit of anger and maybe fatigue at the film industry in some of his later maybe. movies. Cause he's kind of, du- I mean, obviously now he is a much older guy, but he's still going out there making music, doing gigs, but he's so done with the film industry. It feels like, you know, he's just, it feels like he's sick of it. <laughs> you know, He certainly, I mean, this, I mean, they live seems like it's, you know, it's a very cynical film. It feels like it's, yeah. it's, it's sick of everything. Yeah. Um, and he said that, he, that, that when there's like a Texan Donald Trump figure, businessman who says, oh, you know, what's wrong with selling out? People sell out every day. And he said that like a, a, a studio head said that to him. You could just imagine he's got like, the whole thing rattling with disgust, so you can see why he'd be, he'd be completely over it. And also, there's this, there's another thing in the film actually is that um, if you were getting like film school about it, you could say that putting on like the sunglasses, putting those on, turns uh, Roddy Piper into an action hero. It's like suddenly he's in an action movie, whereas before he was in like a realist movie. And then when he puts those on, like it. it it becomes something else. Yes. Maybe yes. there's something interesting in that, but also because they are so exaggerated, you know, putting sunglasses on to see the truth. Mm-hmm. And then he does become so exaggerated. So maybe it's a comment on action movies. Maybe it's one cleverer than we're thinking. Yeah. And and yeah, and I think, you know, there is that there's that there's a moment, isn't there, where they I can't remember what it is. Is it somebody hears something on the TV or something? But you actually hear Carpenter and Romero yeah, mentioned, yeah, don't you, as somebody kind of slating them for having gross, horrible films. And there is again that feeling that Again, it was a similar sort of trajectory for Romero too, right? That they kind of, they had their heyday maybe in sort of the 70s, 80s. And then and then it kind of like, the, the, you know, whether or not they declined, like they sort of ran out of ideas or the film industry was sort of done with them or they were done with the film industry. But it really feels like we're on the cusp of that moment with that incredible generation of horror filmmakers, you know. Definitely. And actually, when you think about it, the end of this film is him is, and Keith David attacking a TV station yes. with the big lie peddlers exactly. and destroying the signal. So maybe this is hit, like maybe that's him putting what and ends with a, a finger up, a literal finger up. <laughs> yeah. uh, so maybe this is like him sticking one finger up to the studios and saying, yeah. like, you know, you're peddling, you're peddling this mindless nonsense. And I'm a uh, wrestler who's gonna I could see through your lies and gonna bring you down maybe exactly. this is like a proper fuck you to that I think it is I think it's an angry teenager saying fuck you to his parents basically <laughs> that's what it is yeah to his <laughs> studio executive parents um, yeah. I love it well there you go and then let's just talk about the ending I mean we've talked about it already not not it doesn't hit the highs that that middle section has but what do you think of kind of the way this movie ends I suppose 
it's quite bad actually to be honest the end is quite bad it's just a it's a quite a naff shoot him up that he's made better of yes. Keith David dies off screen um, yeah Monty shoots down the alien's dish with just one one well placed bullet and holds up his middle finger and then that's the alien threat vanquished and you're like well was it really that easy? Like that just seems, it just seems, it all seems a little bit, you know, there's no guards anywhere. There's no, like, it's just all a little no. bit, yeah, hot shots, to be honest. Yeah, no, I agree. I agree. Mm. Um, so, well, we'll wrap up shortly on uh, They Live. But first of all, let's head on over to this week's Wild About Horror segment because Freudian cinephile Mary Wilde has got plenty of thoughts on John Carpenter's They Live. Hi Mike, Mary Wilde here, joining you to extol the virtues of another John Carpenter classic, the sci-fi action movie, They Live. The film follows a drifter who discovers through special sunglasses that the ruling class are aliens concealing their appearance and manipulating people to consume, breed, and conform to the status quo via subliminal messages in mass media. Carpenter has said that the film's political commentary derives from the dissatisfaction with the economic policies of then-U.S. President Ronald Reagan and increasing commercialization in both the popular culture and politics of the era. He remarked, quote, The film's premise is that the Reagan revolution is run by aliens from another galaxy. Free enterprisers from outer space have taken over the world and are exploiting Earth as if it's a third-world planet. As soon as they exhaust all our resources, they'll move on to another world. I began watching TV again. I quickly realized that everything we see is designed to sell us something. It's all about wanting us to buy something. The only thing they want to do is take our money. End quote. To this end, Carpenter thought of sunglasses as being the tool to perceiving the truth, which is seen in black and white. The aliens in the movie were deliberately made to look like ghouls, according to Carpenter, who said that the creatures are corrupting us, so they themselves are corruptions of human beings. He stated that the film is about yuppies and unrestrained capitalism. The idea for They Live came from a short story called Eight O'Clock in the Morning by Ray Nelson, about an alien invasion and a man put in a trance by a stage hypnotist. When he wakes up, he realizes that the entire human race has been hypnotized and that alien creatures are controlling humanity. He only has until 8 o'clock in the morning to solve the problem. The 2012 documentary film, The Pervert's Guide to Ideology, presented by the philosopher and psychoanalyst Slavoj Žižek, features an interpretation of John Carpenter's They Live. Žižek uses the main trope of the film, the special sunglasses revealing the truth of that which is perceived, to explain his definition of ideology. In the movie, Nada says to Frank, I'll give you a choice, either put on these glasses or start eating that trash can. In response to this, Zizek says, quote, I already am eating from the trash can all the time. The name of this trash can is ideology. The material force of ideology makes me not see what I'm effectively eating. It's not only our reality which enslaves us. The tragedy of our predicament when we are within ideology, is that when we think we escape it into our dreams, at that point, we are within ideology. Zizek sets the scene. Nada and They Live is a pure subject, deprived of all substantial content. His name in Spanish means nothing. He's a homeless worker in LA who, drifting around one day, finds some sunglasses and puts on a pair. As he walks along the city streets, he discovers that these glasses function like critique of ideology glasses. They allow you to see the real message beneath all the propaganda, publicity, glitz, posters, and so on. We live, so we're told, in a post-ideological society. We are interpolated, that is to say, addressed by social authority, not as subjects who should do their duty and sacrifice themselves, but as subjects of pleasures. We're told... Realize your true potential, be yourself, lead a satisfying life. Zizek says that when you put the glasses on, you see the dictatorship in democracy. It's the invisible order which sustains your apparent freedom. The explanation for the existence of these strange ideology glasses is the standard story of the invasion of the body snatchers. 
humanity is already under the control of aliens. According to our common sense, we think that ideology is something blurring, confusing our straight view. Ideology should be glasses, which distort our view. And the critique of ideology should be the opposite, like you take off the glasses so that you can finally see the way things really are. Here, the pessimism of the film they live is well justified, Zizek says. This precisely is the ultimate illusion. Ideology is not simply imposed on ourselves. It is our spontaneous relationship to our social world, how we perceive each meaning, and so on and so on. We, in a way, enjoy our ideology. Zizek goes on to state that stepping out of ideology hurts. It's a painful experience. You must force yourself to do it. This is rendered in a wonderful way with a further scene in Carpenter's film where Nada tries to force his friend Frank to also put the glasses on. It's the weirdest scene because the fight lasts for ages. It may appear irrational because why does Frank reject so violently to put the glasses on? It's as if he is well aware that spontaneously he lives in a lie and the glasses will make him see the truth, but that this truth can be painful. It can shatter many illusions. This is a paradox we have to accept, the extreme violence of liberation. You must be forced to be free. If you trust simply your spontaneous sense of well-being, you will never get free. Freedom hurts, end quote. You might not be terribly surprised to learn that I completely agree with Slavoj Žižek's interpretation of They Live. And I'd like to expand on it, comment further on why it should be the case that free marketeers would come to embody an alienating dimension in relation to the ordinary worker living under the dominance of neoliberalism. In the 1980s, Ronald Reagan and Margaret Thatcher insisted that there is no alternative to laissez-faire economics. They kick-started a privatization bonanza, enforced fiscal austerity, deregulated the financial sector, and reduced government spending in order to enhance the role of the private sector. We were promised that giving unrestricted economic benefits to the rich would benefit society as a whole, that the wealthy elite would create jobs and opportunities for everyone, that prosperity would trickle down. However, the outcome has been that the poorest have become poorer and the richest even richer. What we have is a Wild West casino-style economics. The relevance of this to John Carpenter's film is the discrepancy between knowing life's hardships all too well while being propagandized relentlessly about attaining some arbitrary aspirational dream, a designer fantasy that is so very distant to the harsh reality of material scarcity. Turning a blind eye to this incongruity may very well be a natural impulse, as Zizek suggests, in the sense that clutching onto a neoliberal ideology maintains us in a reassuring position, and we escape the overwhelming pressure of acting freely. But I would argue that it nevertheless creates a dangerous cognitive dissonance in which we are having to pretend to not know something, despite the surplus of evidence and brutal force of our own lived experience. This ever-widening psychological gap, I would argue, is the real source of alienation, an abyss into which we continue to drift bearing witness to economic injustice, but playing along, participating in the gaslighting script of it all, unable to call it out. The ghoulish features of the alien overlords in They Live are really a projection, a displacement of our own utterly fragmented state, living divorced from ourselves. As ever, it is more comforting to imagine the externalized perpetrator than to confront our own incapacity to act courageously when the moment requires it. This is the strength of John Carpenter's film, in my opinion. Recognizing our own atomization at the center of the story is essential so that we can work towards a sustainable solution to the problem of economic inequity. It's vital to be upfront about this. Otherwise, we remain in a deadlock of eating out of the trash can of ideology. Till next time. A big thank you to the wonderful Mary Wilde. And don't forget, if you want to hear more of Mary's takes and thoughts on Freudian cinephilia, then you can sign up to her Patreon, patreon.com slash Mary Wilde. 
Okay, Matt, we are going to wrap up shortly, but just some final thoughts on They Live. Let me ask you, where do you find it sort of ranks? You know, we've talked about Carpenter's other work briefly. Where does this rank for you in the sort of Carpenter canon? Ooh, it's about, it's about two thirds of the way down the Carpenter canon, but only right. because that canon is, is so damn strong. Mm-hmm. And actually it holds up pretty well and it's well made yeah. uh, it's, the effects practical effects are really great uh, it's really well put together there's just something as we've discussed off about how it's been conceived mm. and so yeah it just it's almost like a rush job in some respects and a little bit more thought or even and I hate to say this like a really well done remake it's gonna, could really fix those problems mm-hmm. so yeah I, I still think it's it's really worth a watch after all these years and mm. it's um, an more than a footnote in his career but it's just such an interesting anomaly the other thing i thought of as well just by the way is is uh, bruce campbell there was something of bruce campbell and evil dead maybe about this film too in in its kind of slapstick fight scenes and that kind of thing as well and his one-liners and that kind of thing i almost wonder if that again it's sort of trying at that kind of tone that kind of slightly silly schlocky but funny kind of Again, there's a there's a slight teenage boy element almost to that yeah. kind of evil dead and, humor, you know. And all that stuff only comes in once he's put the sunglasses on. So, yeah, like I say, yeah. maybe it starts off as a, like Carpenter's version of a social realist thing, mm-hmm. and then explodes into him actually satirizing the action yeah. film. Maybe that's the best way to to read it. Um, um, yeah, but I agree with you. It, it's kind of middle, lower middle tier Carpenter for yeah. me. I mean, obviously, it's a lot better than some of the other stuff he's done since, but. It's so difficult to, to 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 sort of judge it up against so many of the classics that he'd done by this point. Um, just out of interest, what is your favourite Carpenter? What is my favourite Carpenter? Uh, my... <laughs> Can I be... Van- is it really vanilla if I say Halloween? I mean, no, it's a masterpiece. No. Like, you know what I mean? Like, I know it would be more interesting to say in the mouth of madness or whatever, but Halloween is one of the greatest horror films ever made. I'm a horror film journalist primarily, and... It couldn't really be better. Like I love the other side. I love the fog. Love the thing. Mm-hmm. Um, you know. But no. Yeah, I'm gonna go with Halloween. Sorry. No, I love it. It's that's actually my, that's my desert island carpenter. Do you know what? Like it's actually not as common as you think. Like most people I speak to say the thing, including me. I, I would say the thing is his masterpiece. But but obviously Halloween. You know, there are a lot of masterpieces for, to choose from. I think when it comes to early carpenter. But uh, yeah, Halloween's wonderful. Have you, by the way, have you seen Halloween Kills yet? Have you managed no, to check no, it out? No, I haven't. Um, <laughs> I, uh, I, no, I haven't. I, I, I haven't heard very good things about it. It's so not I great. It's not great. Check, I didn't check it out. Okay, so it's my time is fun, but it's not great. You know, My time is very precious to me at the moment. So the idea of uh, if I'm going to go and see something, I need to like at least have a chance that it's going to be good. So mm. when people that I trust tell me something isn't good, I need the time for sleep and other things. So I, I think that's fair. I would maybe not prioritise it. Let's put. It I didn't like the yeah. last Halloween, so I, I seem the sequel to one I didn't like seems unlikely to. Yeah. Um, yeah. If there was ever a horror franchise, right, that that went down so rapidly between the first movie and its sequels, you know, I think compared to even the Friday the Thirteenth or Elm Street or other franchises, Halloween just has such a such a dip in terms of its legacy of of everything that came after it. You know, yeah, absolutely. It's only H two O for me, and then the rest of them can all just basically be basically be forgotten, written off. Um, yeah, 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 yeah. Sorry, there guys. You go. There you go. <laughs> um, well, on that note, uh, we will wrap it up there, um, Matt. Which is your favourite of those two movies we just discussed? If you were to recommend one to somebody right now, would you recommend The Hidden or They Live? What they should do is they should watch the beginning of The Hidden, <laughs> watch the middle section of They Live, <laughs> yeah. and then just do something and then, else. And then just put on some telly. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Not, great, the, not great final act either way. And that is, a good, that is one good night, though. Trust me. It really is, isn't it? Yeah, incredible. Um, well, Matt, thank you so much. It's been an absolute pleasure. And I promise you, next time you come back, we'll talk about something proper, proper horror, even something that you would class as horror, okay? Um, Amazing. But, uh, but until then, uh, just remind people where they can find you and more of your writing and more of your stuff out there online. You can find me at, at Matt Glasby on Twitter or mattglasby.com. You can find stuff about the Book of Horror at, at the Book of Horror. Um, and yeah, uh, it's in all good bookshops and Amazon, wherever you buy your books. Take a look. Amazing. Matt, thank you so much for joining me. Thanks very much. 
And that's it for this week. Thank you so much for listening and a huge thank you to this week's guest, Matt Glasby. Uh, so let me know your thoughts. What do you think of these two films? Uh, Jack Shoulders' The Hidden and John Carpenter's They Live. Do you agree or disagree with me and Matt and our takes? Please do get in touch. The email address is evolutionofhorror at gmail.com. You can also find us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram and Letterboxd. And if you want to discuss this week's movies and anything else horror related, with fellow listeners then don't forget you can join the discussion group that's the evolution of horror discussion group and you can find that on facebook you can find all previous episodes and seasons of this podcast on our website that's evolution of horror.com on our website you can also find our merch store where you can pick up your own eoh t-shirt or hoodie uh, evolution of horror.com forward slash shop you can find this podcast on all the normal podcast places and if you get a spare minute we would be so grateful if you could drop us a little rating or review preferably a positive one on apple podcasts which really helps us get discovered by new listeners so on to next week and we continue in a vein of sort of not quite horror uh, alien sci-fi uh, blockbusters next week we're moving into the mid 90s i'm going to be joined by a brand new guest gav murphy and we're going to be talking about independence day from 1996 and tim burton's mars attacks from the same year should be an incredibly fun discussion join us next week for all of this and more on the evolution of horror.